Welcome everyone to chapter 5. This chapter is all about water, arguably the most important chemical for life on earth. We're going to cover a lot of ground in this chapter, but by the end of it you should be able to draw multiple interacting water molecules, identifying the atoms and types of bonds in those molecules, as well as the charges associated with the atoms. Explain how the molecular structure of the water contributes to the unique properties of water. And explain how each of these properties is useful to life on Earth. You'll be able to describe the hydrologic cycle, including the different ways water moves and is stored throughout the cycle. We'll look at how much water is available on Earth and how it is distributed. We'll look at the major sectors of human water use the difference between consumptive and non-consumptive use, the difference between return flow and withdrawals, and which sectors in the U.S. are primarily responsible for each type of use. Additionally, we'll explain how agriculture stresses water resources. We'll explain water-related problems such as water scarcity, waterborne diseases, water pollution and flooding, as well as describe solutions to those water-related problems. And finally, we'll talk about water management practices in the U.S. To start, we need to review what we previously learned about the molecular construction of water. You know that water is H2O, which means that it is compromised of two atoms of hydrogen H and one atom of oxygen O. These atoms are covalently bonded to each other, meaning that they share their electrons with each other. Remember, ionic molecules transfer electrons between their atoms. Covalent molecules share their electrons. And this sharing relationship is not an equal one because oxygen is far more electron greedy than hydrogen is and it will draw the electrons towards itself and away from its hydrogen atom partners. As a result, the distribution of the electrons is more concentrated around the oxygen atom and less concentrated around the hydrogen atoms. You'll recall that electrons carry a negative electric charge, and so this makes it so that the oxygen atom is slightly negative because it's got a heavy load of electrons on it, while the hydrogen atoms uh, are slightly positive because, it's, because the negative electrons have been drawn away from them, leaving the positive protons in their nucleus to be the predominant charge. Consequently, we describe water as a polar molecule because it has separate positive and negative poles within its structure due to this uneven electron sharing. And the fact that water is polar is the fundamental cause of certain properties that make it an extremely unique chemical and give it the ability to support life. We went into some of these properties in chapter two and we are going to revisit them now in more detail. In our previous look at water, we explained how when you have a sample of water, you're talking about a large number of molecules in that sample that are interacting with each other. Due to the fact that each of these water molecules has positive ends and negative ends within its structure, there's a network of attractions. between the hydrogen of one molecule and the oxygen of a separate molecule, represented here by the yellow dotted lines. We explained the existence of this network of attractions previously, but we didn't actually state what they are called. Each little yellow dotted line that you see here is referred to as a hydrogen bond. Okay. These hydrogen bonds bring about a certain bring, bring about certain water water properties as a chemical, one of which is called cohesion. Cohesion is the tendency of water molecules to stick to each other. The example we cited previously of where you can see this in action is when you drop water onto the surface of a penny and a dome shape forms rather than the water simply running off. 
So co cohesion is responsible for water's ability to beat up and form droplets. And cohesion also creates surface tension in water. Surface tension is an attraction between molecules on the surface of a body of water that allow them to support force. Not a lot of force, mind you, but some force. The fact that certain insects are able to stand on the surface of a body of water and remain supported there, as you can see in this image, is a result of water surface tension. But water molecules aren't just attracted to other water molecules. Those slight positive and negative ends that are part of the water molecule also make it attracted to other non-water molecules. This property is called adhesion. So whereas cohesion is the tendency of water molecules to stick to each other, adhesion is the tendency of water molecules to stick to other molecules. One example of where you can see adhesion at work is through a phenomenon called capillary action. Capillary action is the tendency of a liquid to rise within a small tube due to the liquid being attracted to the material of the tube. In this snipped, snippet of a video, you can see a glass of water that has had yellow food coloring added to it, and a small glass tube is inserted into the water, and immediately the water very quickly climbs up into the little glass tube. No one is sucking on the tube like a straw. The water just jumps up on its own because the molecules are attracted to the glass of the tube. The water doesn't climb all the way up the tube because gravity doesn't allow it. But for a, certain, for a certain distance, those adhesive forces are stronger than gravity, so as a small amount of the water can climb. This might seem like it's just a neat little demonstration exercise, but it's actually very important for living organisms because capillary action is how water moves through up and through plants, traveling from the root system up to the stems and shoots and other parts of the plant. And capillary action is also involved in the movement of blood through the circulatory system, so it serves a biological purpose. Another important property of water that arises from its polar molecule, from it being a polar molecule, is that it is the universal solvent on Earth. What this means is that water, is e water easily dissolves ionic molecules and other polar covalent molecules. The existence of this network of attractions within water, which we now know are called hydrogen bonds, makes it so that other substances that also have any sort of electric charge can be dropped into water and they will fit right into that network of attractions. So for example, we previously looked at the case of table salt, sodium chloride. The chemical abbreviation for which is NaCl. Salt is an ionic molecule. The sodium, represented by Na, the one shown in dark blue there, transfers one of its electrons to the chlorine, which is represented by Cl and shown in red. And so the sodium gains a positive electric charge, the chlorine gains a negative electric charge. And when you put the whole thing in water, those electric charges play well with the charges that are present in the water molecule and water molecules. In fact, these ionic molecules like salt fit in with water molecules so well that the two ions won't even remain together. They'll separate from each other and be pulled apart by their attraction to the water molecules. This is what's going on when you drop salt into water. Stir it up and watch it disappear and become homogeneous within the water. The salt molecules are being pulled apart by the water and the ions that make them up are fully dissolving in it. So water is a very good um, uh, chemical at dissolving things as long as they are ionic or, um, yes, or as long as they are polar, just like water is. In fact, water can dissolve more substances than any other known liquid, which is why we refer to it as the universal solvent. A solvent is an agent in which other substances can dissolve, and no liquid that we know of is better than dissolving things in water. This is essential 
for living organisms because they are made in large part of water. And the fact that water is such a good solvent means that important biological molecules can dissolve in it. And it can serve as a medium for transporting those molecules and allowing chemical reactions to take place inside of your cells and your body. Yet another property of water that arises from its polarity and hydrogen bonding ability is the fact that solid water is less dense than liquid water. This is embodied by ice floating on water, which is not actually a normal occurrence. Typically, the solid form of a substance is more dense than the liquid form and will sink rather than float on the liquid. However, for water, it is the opposite. This is because when water solidifies, the hydrogen bonds hold the water molecules in a well-defined crystalline structure, which you can see on the bottom left. The hydrogen bonds will hold the molecule at a certain distance from each other. And as a result, the structure of solid water is more open and less dense than liquid water, which you can see illustrated in the circle on the right. The lower density of solid water means that ice floats on water. And the environmental consequences of this is that when a body of water freezes, only the top layer of water molecules, the ones that are most exposed, will actually freeze and create a surface layer of ice that insulates the water below. If ice was more dense than water and sank to the bottom, then what would happen is entire bodies of water would freeze solid rather than just the top layer killing the living organisms that right in, reside in, inside them. The next feature of water is its high specific heat capacity. We touched on this before when we discussed how water is able to maintain a stable temperature. And I had posed to you the thought experiment of which you, would you rather do on a hot summer day, lay on the hood of your car or jump into your pool? The answer is the pool, because unlike the car, the temperature of the pool is reasonable in spite of the heat. Why does water maintain a stable temperature? Well, what temperature of a substance actually measures is the kinetic energy of its molecules. Remember, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And so when we say temperature measures kinetic energy, uh, what we mean is that temperature measures how much of, and how quickly the molecules in that substance are moving and vibrating and churning around. More molecular motion means the temperature is higher. In the case of water, the network of hydrogen bonds between the molecules keeps them stable and steady and prevents them from moving even when exposed to high amounts of heat. Therefore, the temperature of, wa of the water remains relatively stable because its molecules stick together and resist increases in their movement. The temperature stability of a substance is wrapped up in a measurement we call specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And water has the highest specific heat capacity of any liquid. This uh, meaning that it takes more heat energy to increase the temperature of water um, uh, by one degree Celsius. Uh, the chart on the right gives you a sense of how the specific heat capacity of water measures up to some other substances. For water, it takes one calorie of energy to raise one gram of it by one degree Celsius. For oil, it takes less than half of that amount of energy, uh, 0 0.4 calories. For alcohol, it's 0 0.57 calories. Dry soil or sand is 0 0.19 calories. Wood is 0 0.14 calorie, and iron is 0 0.11 calories. So as you can see, compared to other substances, it takes much more energy to increase the temperature of water. Related to water's high specific heat capacity is its high heat of vaporization. Water doesn't just maintain a stable temperature, but a stable state of matter meaning that it resists changes in its state, whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas. Whereas specific heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of a substance one degree Celsius, heat of vaporization 
uh, is the amount of heat energy required to change one gram of a liquid into a gas. And just like water has a very high specific heat capacity, water has a very high heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of heat energy to turn liquid water into water vapor, which is the gaseous form of water. That's because once again, the hydrogen bonds between water molecules cause them to stick together and make it difficult for individual water molecules to break free from the liquid and transform into a gas, which is exactly what happens when something goes from liquid to gas. Water's resistance to vaporization is important for living organisms because, as you can imagine, if water evaporated easily, then the water inside living organisms would be at risk of turning into vapor when it gets hot outside. On that same note, entire bodies of water, like lakes, would be at risk of evaporating when it gets hot. So water's stable state of matter prevents this from happening. So that's a lot of highly detailed information about the chemistry of water. So before we close out, let's summarize what we've just learned in this section. Water is a polar molecule that has slight positive and negative charges within its structure. This causes a network of hydrogen bonds to form between water molecules when you have a large number of them. As a result, water molecules exhibit cohesion. The tendency of water molecules to stick together, which leads to their ability to beat up and form droplets, as well as adhesion. The tendency of water molecules to stick to other non-water substances, which leads to their ability to travel via capillary action, which is a force that mediates what movement of water through living organisms, for example, through plant roots. Water also serves as a universal solvent for molecules that are ionic, as well as ones that are polar. These molecules can dissolve in water because they, too, have charges within their structure that can interact with the charges found on the water molecules. The solid form of water is less dense than the liquid form of water because when water solidifies, it forms a crystalline structure where the hydrogen bonds hold the water molecules in a well-defined pattern that opens up the structure of the solid material. As a result, Ice floats on water and aquatic organisms don't freeze solid in bodies of water because only the surface level of water turns to ice. Water also has a high specific heat capacity, meaning that it has to absorb a lot of heat before it changes temperature. So it maintains a relatively stable temperature, which is important for living organisms. And finally, water has a high heat of vaporization which means that it has to absorb a lot of heat before it changes state from liquid to gas. So it maintains a stable state as well, and that is important for living organisms too.